How much have you spent in real estate over the years? Oh, over a billion, maybe two billion. This man has a real estate portfolio worth over $200 million. He also has one of the most rare car collections in the world and has a gigantic social media following. But none of this was handed to him. Manny Koshpin and his parents immigrated to America from Iran, and times were so rough that they all had to live out of a station wagon, his parents and multiple siblings. What's it like to sleep in a car with six people? A lot of cold nights. You know, sometimes you're subconsciously, you block it. It wasn't easy, yeah. With no clear path of success, Manny dropped out of college and started several businesses that failed. One of our friends used to sell gas stations, open escrow, I put my $20,000 in a bank, turned out to be a con artist, I lost all my money. But despite these setbacks, things began to look up for Manny when he discovered real estate and now closes deals that are worth nine figures alone. In the real estate yep. portfolio, what's been like the biggest win you've had? My biggest win, 50 million on one property. So how did he do it? In this video, we sit down with Manny Koshpin to hear the story of how a failed entrepreneur became one of the most respected names in real estate. So I'm Manny Koshpin. I made my money in real estate, primarily commercial real estate. I have a passion for cars, as you guys can see, but my journey wasn't easy. I probably went through five or six different businesses. I failed many times until I found success in buying real estate, adding value, flipping it for a profit. And I've been doing that for nearly 30 years now. And so for your story, you yeah. grew up in Iran. What was going on? And then what was the story for you to, to come to America? Iran obviously had history of war with Iraq. At the time the war was going on, my dad had um, several brothers that got injured. One of them died from chemical bombs they used in the, at the war. And two weeks before my 14th birthday, my dad decided to, you know, just take off and avoid me going to the army because at age 14, they basically, you, you cannot leave the country and you got to submit to an army. Okay. And that's pretty young age. And seeing what happened to his brothers, he didn't want me to go get killed or get injured. So two weeks before my 14th birthday, we decided to leave Iran, went to Turkey, he was able to get a visa and we came to US. None of us have spoke a word of English except my dad. My dad had been to US before and you know, he was educated and luckily he spoke English, but um, I took three hours of ESL for the first two years in high school when I was here from 14 to 16, because I didn't speak any word of English. So uh, pretty challenging upbringing because we didn't have any money. We ran out of money. We ended up, you know, living in a car for a few months. I think my dad got a job, was able to get an apartment. And, uh, but all that pressure, everybody went on there because of me, that kind of gave me the guilt trip and I turned that into motivation, try to be successful so I can retire my parents, pay them back, and I did just that. Yeah, just <laughs> after many different failures uh, early on. But yeah, it's been a uh, very uh, interesting journey and I'm happy to share it because I know there's a lot of immigrants that come to this country for the American dream and they get discouraged after a couple of failures and that was exactly me but look at me now, so. When you came to America not speaking English, do you remember what your first week was like? Because I, I, can't, I can't imagine what that experience is like for someone so young. Yeah, well, you're just like on a different planet. You know, I don't know my way around, I don't have any friends, I don't speak, and I don't have any money. So basically, you know, Americans that are born into this country, they have all of that, which I didn't have. So I had a pretty um, rough start, if you want to call it. But um, yeah, as a matter of fact, when we first moved here, we went to a Motel 6 in Costa Mesa. And then after you know a few nights, my dad figured out we're gonna run out of money. So we moved into a car. <laughs> but I was at the pool, I remember, and there was a, this young kid, he was giving me the bird, you know? I don't wanna put it in. You could do that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he was giving me the bird and, and I thought he's saying hi. So I was like patting him <laughs> on the back. And then the other guy was saying, <laughs> Somebody was sitting at the pool. He goes, no, no, that's not good, not good. I didn't know what the heck is going on. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't, not only I didn't speak English, I didn't know the sign language. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. What, what's it like to sleep in a car with six people? And like, oh, you guys at a station wagon? It's not good. Yeah, it was a 1972 Datsun, a station wagon, um, a lot of cold lights. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't good. But you know, um, I think it was so much suffering and mentally pressure on my mom, especially that, you know, sometimes you're subconsciously, you block it, you don't think about it. I look at the good times now, <laughs> yeah. but uh, it wasn't easy. Yeah, I tried, yeah no, it's good. What were your parents telling you during that time? 
And how are they? Well, my parents wanted me to go to college. So I attended two weeks of college, IBC. It's in Irvine. And then I realized, you know, everybody's monkeying around, throwing paper at each other, pens. And I'm like, I showed up there with a briefcase. You know, I'm like, wearing a suit. I'm ready to make money. <laughs> really? Yeah. And then after two weeks, I quit. And my mom didn't talk to me for like several months. She was very depressed and upset. But um, I was eager to make money, right? So at age 18, I started my own business selling nuts door to door. That was my first business. It did great until health department find me. They said, hey, you got to have health permit every time you repackage, repackage food for resale. And I didn't know that. So I closed that. But I had about $20,000 saved. And then I realized, you know, I may, maybe I sh should put that to work. And one of our friends uh, used to sell gas stations. Because okay. you know what? 20 grand, you could buy a mobile gas station because you get, you know, 90% financing. I'm like, really? Yeah, I was 20, I was, I think 20 at the time. So we opened escrow. I put my $20,000 in a bank, gave me a loan officer, turned out to be a con artist, and uh, I lost all my money. So was, that was my first real failure, back to zero. Because it's one thing not having money and not making it, but once you make it and then you go back to zero, it's, it's a hard landing, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, and then I went back to working at Winston Tires um, to, again, work for somebody else to save money. And then I got my real estate license because every time I was, uh, I was having a Porsche, Ferrari coming to a tire shop and I was upselling them, you know, brakes, tires, whatever, alignment, I realized, I would ask, I would say, hey, what do you do for a living? And they would say, oh, either I'm an attorney, but nine out of 10 times either they own a mortgage company or real estate, mm. right? I'm like, wow, so real estate's good. So I got my license and then one of the customers that used to come to Winston Tires hired me as a loan officer. So I worked at a loan company for a, less than a year and then I learned everything and then I opened my own mortgage company. In 1993, I was 22 years old, um, opened a mortgage company, I made 290,000 bucks the first year. And that was my first taste of success. <laughs> Real money, right? At 22, 23 years old, having that, that kind of money. So I bought a 500 SL, I bought a small little uh, condo. I was wearing three-piece suits, smoking cigars. That was like, I fell on top of the mountain. And then rates went up and all my mortgages died because back then there was a refinance boom. Okay. And you wouldn't lock your rates in, you would wait, you know, get all the loans approved and then lock them at the last minute to get a bigger rebate from the bank. So I had 40 loans on my boards. Rates went up. Greenspan, 1994, I think he took the rates up three quarters basis point. Kind of similar to what's happening now. You know, today the Fed increased the rates for the 10 consecutive time, right? Um, and all my loans went dead. We closed that down. And then I uh, figured, hey, I got a couple hundred thousand dollars saved. Uh, I realized discount stores are doing good, 99 cent only stores. Yeah. I said, why don't I do 79 cents a store, 79 cents plus. So I opened a 10,000 square feet store in Santa Ana, uh, 79 cents plus, and I started making good money. And then I opened a second location that didn't do well. I closed that one down. And then Food for Less opened right next to me. They started competing with me. And I started going from making 20, 30 grand a month cash to losing money. So at that point, I'm like, this is my second failure. So I start selling my cars. I sold my condo. And I, after two years, I owe 200 some thousand on my credit cards, paying 20% plus interest rate. And everybody told me about bankruptcy because I owed money to Pepsi, Coca-Cola, Rockview Farms, you know, all these vendors, right? They give me 30 days term. And so my accounts payable was going up. My, cat, my sales were dropping because this big store opened next to me competing with me. And I said, I'm not going to file bankruptcy. This country, by then I knew, you know, because I was a mortgage business, this country is built on credit. If I file bankruptcy, I'm dead, right? So I fought and basically fired, not fired, but let go of about several employees. And I called my parents to come and become cashiers. So I took me two or two and a half years to kind of get to a positive cash flow. And I ended up selling it for 185,000. And then I still owed more than I got from escrow from selling the mm. store. So I'm like, okay, if I pay my credit cards, I'm still gonna be in the hole. So I opened the E-Trade account. This was December, 1998. I opened the E-Trade account, I started trading stocks. So I got it up to 700 grand by September, 1999. 
Then I pulled most of it out and I bought a shopping center and two REO homes. And that's how I started my real estate. What, what were the, uh, the skills that you developed at, at this early time that, that other people should be learning from? Because I, I definitely think one that sounds like selling. And mm-hmm. another thing you did, which I thought was amazing, is that if you're seeing someone that has something you're interested in, you asked. It sounded like when you saw these people bringing nice cars, like, what are you doing? Because yeah. I can maybe copy what they're doing. I would say definitely be curious. Always ask questions, be a sponge. Um, even now, I mean, I'm always on Google, YouTube. I'm always learning what's going on, what's, what are the trends, what's happening. But always surround yourself with people that are more successful than you. And also be curious, always ask questions. And I would say, you know, take a sales position in anything. Because when you do sales, you're interacting with people, you learn a lot. You know, everything almost in life is sales. You know, so that would be my advice. How do you think Im- being an immigrant impact your success, especially early on? Well, I think the hunger, um, you know, coming from another country, you're, you feel you're, you know, you're in a new environment and you want to prove yourself. You're also learning, right? Because you don't know the environment. You don't know the, how the business works, the system works. But more than anything, I think just the, the hunger in me because... I didn't, I was rock bottom. I didn't have any place to go but up, you know. And I think that was what um, created that drive in me, you know. And a lot of people take that freedom, resources, friends, being able to speak English, all that for granted because they're here, right? But if you take all that away from you, you get really desperate. <laughs> yeah. Real quick. How do you think others can benefit that that aren't immigrants with that mentality or how can they... Uh, practice that or develop that well challenging themselves uh, for one you could still go you know us is over 50 states you can go to other states that are you know having a new driver as an economy and open a new business just challenging yourself you know instead of setting stagnant someplace you know what were what were some of the discrimination or challenges you faced? oh my god I can go on and on on that one. That, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Camel riders, that nigga. Oh, okay, no, no, no. Really? Well, oh, yeah. Well, back then, there was still a lot of discrimination, especially towards Middle Easterns. So I used to work at Kmart. My first job was at Kmart at age 16. Uh, I was mopping floors, collecting shopping carts. And I used to always avoid walking my cafeteria because they, I used, they used to call me names. So I used to go around. <laughs> you know, but... You know, luckily that period's over. Um, U.S. is now primarily a lot of immigrants. So, you know, that, that it's a lot, a lot less now, right, than uh, 40 years ago. But it was tough. Um, a lot of name calling. Especially when I was selling nuts. I remember one time I was selling nuts. So what I used to do with my nut business used to go to all the auto dealerships because I used to sell you know, cashews, trail mix, candies to the secretaries. And then the salespeople love nuts, you know, <laughs> you know, the, the trail mix, pistachios and whatever. So <laughs> one time I walked to a Toyota dealership, I think it was Toyota anyway. Um, and the, this GM came at me yelling, screaming in front of everybody. The entire sales floor. I mean, got that F out. Blah, blah, blah. And it was very humiliating. And I'm standing there with my basket of nuts. So uh, I remember, you know, walking out, I had tears in my eyes. I'm like, you know what? It's okay. Suck it up. And I went to the next dealership and I sold some nuts. So yeah, you just got to keep going, right? Yeah. Do you think you, you used that discrimination and name calling and like negativity and, and funneled that over, over the years, right? Because you, you were selling to these car dealerships yeah. and now you have your own dealership. Yeah, I guess so. If you put it that way, <laughs> you know, sometimes... Uh, you know, life gives you challenges or sometimes people cause challenge for you, right? Um, you can either accept it and get defeated or you can prove them wrong, you know? So I turn my doubters or haters uh, now into my followers. <laughs> <laughs> and then I can't imagine also feeling so discriminated and discouraged at these times. And then how did you even know what to think of a vision? Because what I'm noticing of some people is they, they, they don't know how big they can even dream. Like, or how far they can even go. So how were you thinking about that? And how did you get born? I just on? looked at people that were around me that were successful. Like, uh, you know, when I was at Winston Tire, I used to see people coming there with Mercedes convertible, a few times Ferrari, but a lot of Porsches. So early on, to me, success was having a convertible Mercedes, you know. And that's the first car I bought when I made money. 
but I didn't even know there is a Bugatti in existence. I don't know what Bugatti is. But then when I got, you know, uh, years later, I got involved with higher caliber friends that had Bugattis. I'm like, wow, I learned, you know, how much technology legacy is behind the story behind Bugatti, Ettore Bugatti that built Bugatti. Then I started building a passion for cars and, you know, they're like fine arts. Yeah. And uh, so your dream keeps growing with you as long as you uh, have the drive in you to grow. What's your definition of the American dream? The definition of the American dream is you can just wake up in the morning and decide uh, to take off for two months anywhere you want to go in the world and not have to worry about paying the bills. And do you think this still exists? Of course. I mean, if you really want it bad enough and you're patient, anyone can do it. I believe that. But you got to have the drive, you got to have the hunger, and you got to have the never give up mentality because surely you're going to get to a point, you're going to have a dead end, and you're going to have to make a U turn and find a different route. Hmm. The, well, I'm assuming you think you achieved it. I think so. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I still, my wife is still tells me that I'm in denial sometimes. <laughs> and, um, well, you know, when you're accumulating wealth, more cars, this, that, sometimes you don't stop to kind of enjoy it because you're always hustling. But yeah, I think I have achieved it. What is up, my friends? If you are loving this video, you're going to love my free weekly newsletter, The Golden Nuggets. You can go to okdork.com slash nuggets to subscribe. I put three tips each and every week to help you succeed on your business journey. A marketing tip, a productivity app, a YouTube video that impacted me, and more. Make sure you're subscribed if you're not already. It's exclusive content just for email subscribers okdork.com slash nuggets, or there'll be a link below in the description. How did you make your first million in real estate? Can you tell us uh, more in detail yes. about that deal? Sure. So that was a commercial property year 2000. Uh, because I did own this store, I could qualify for SBA loan for a commercial property to build a vacant building in, on First Street in Santa Ana. I bought that with 10% down, $67,000 out of pocket. I remodeled it, and then I sold for $1.6 in less than a year. So... That was my first million bucks um, on a single flip. And then I turned that and used the cash to my advantage and I started writing a lot of offers on apartment buildings in Long Beach, you know, six unit and up. And I was able to buy some, you know, with short closing. So use that to my advantage of getting a price reduction in return, close it quick with no contingency. And uh, so again, I took risk, but it was calculated risk because I knew, hey, if they're asking 900 grand, and I offer them 650 grand, they settle for 700, I just made $200,000, right? Less than what they're asking because I was able to perform quick and buy the as is. And then I did that, so I flipped probably two, 300 units, and then I started doing office buildings, the similar concept. And as a matter of fact, the building I recently bought for 22 million, I owed a million and a half dollar non-refundable deposit day one, and there was an offer 26 million, four million more, but the seller gave it to me for 22. So how did he, why did they do that? Because they wanted certainty. So seller was very wealthy individual and just wanted certainty that the person is going to close. The other offers had 90 day due diligence. They wanted to develop it, go to the city, see what they could be built on it. He just wanted certainty. So in real estate, you want to see what the seller's objective is. And if you can fill that void and you make, you know, make extra money up front. So <laughs> I, I, I do like that because it's like yeah. if you can deal with more uncertainty, you can get bigger upside. Yeah. What, what was it like to make the first million? And how? how oh, it was great. So uh, I think it was 2000 or 2001. So I'm born in 71. So I was 30, 29 or 30. It was great because back then a million dollars was a lot of money. Right now, a million dollars is not a lot of money, right? Or maybe it is. I don't know. <laughs> you lose the uh, concept of money when, you know, you buy $5 million cars. Um, but no, it was unbelievable. Obviously, I did a 1031 exchange, but when I had my statement that shows a million dollars in 1031 exchange cash, that was, uh, it was a good feeling. I felt like I made it. And like Borat says, great success. <laughs> is, that, is that the moment you felt like you made the American dream or when was yeah. that? Well, that was definitely a, a milestone that I never forget. Because I was writing offers, you know, buying the six unit, nine unit apartment complex, all cash, 10 day close. 
and I was 30 years old. It was like, you know, that's a pretty good feeling. You're sending a powerful scene when you can tell somebody, hey, I'll close in one week, uh, but I want 200,000 off, you know. And, uh, and that worked out really well for me too, because that was year 2001, 2002. And then this real estate had a good run up till 2007. So I was able to, you know, amass a portfolio from that $1 million I started to over a hundred million dollars in real estate by 2007. If someone is just starting out and they want to make a million dollars in real estate, and yeah. that's that their goal liquid, uh, and they have they don't have much money though. Like, mm -hmm. what, what would be the steps they'd follow? So you said you're saying mm -hmm. residential. Like, how would you think about that? Yeah, residential. Well, nowadays with technology, back when I started 30 years ago, there was no internet, so I had to actually fly out to Houston, meet with the listing broker, walk the properties, and then I would pick which one I want to mm -hmm. buy. Now, you get on CoStar, LoopNet, there's so many multiple listed services, you can kind of do your research online. And to that point, you can also network with other people that have money. And if you do your research and you find a nice value at real estate that's distressed and you do your research, say, hey, okay, this is mismanaged. If we do this to this out parcel, this tenant, sell it separately or lease this subdivided, lease it to multiple and smaller tenants that pay higher rent per foot. Um, the comps are there to support double the price. And you go to an investor, network with other investors that have equity, bring them as an equity partner and make a million bucks. You can do a split. There's so many ways, so many options you have now that you didn't have 30 years ago. So whoever says they can make a million bucks, that's just an excuse. They haven't tried hard enough. So doesn't mean it's going to happen overnight. It may take them a year to two years to absorb and study that market to be able to sell that to an equity investor. This is a, a business that takes time to get educated and power up. So the thing that's in, I've always kind of avoided about real estate is saying mm -hmm. anyone can do it. Like I do tech because that's much harder or making videos like this. It's like yeah. not everyone can go and do these things, but I, I'm missing like everyone's doing real estate. How are you able yeah. to be in the, the sounds like the top echelon performance? Like what were you doing? Well, different? I would say my timing was I was very lucky because that uh, you know, five, six year of uh, run, uh, run we had in real estate, it was unprecedented, similar to what happened, you know, in the past five years, right? But I use the same concept of, you know, just flipping out of each value add into the bigger deal. So basically I scaled my portfolio. Okay? And I, at some point I had over 2 million square feet um, in real estate, mostly in Houston. And then in 2007, I realized just like 1999, when I sold my stocks, I realized, okay, this is a little too good to be true. People were bidding on my high-rise buildings from Florida, New York, without seeing it on a $18 million high-rise. I had multiple offers. I'm like, this is not normal. It's just too good to be true. So I sold my portfolio in 2007, made a lot of money. At 1031 Exchange, I bought a bunch of shopping centers that are anchored by grocery stores and a bunch of about a million square feet of industrial, Halliburton, FedEx, Continental Airline. These were all of them in Houston uh, because I knew those tenants have a strong balance sheet and they can weather the storm. If we have a recession, we were not surely what happened. We had a recession. Most of my high rises went back to the bank. I ended up buying five of them from the banking three years later and sold them again. That's another story. But <laughs> so what I'm yeah. saying is if you, if you take out the risk, and you know how to underwrite a property, and you know you're on the right cycle, your timing's right, uh, real estate is pretty predictable. How many places have you bought, and I think it's, on, and how much have you spent in real estate over the years? Oh, over a billion, maybe two billion, I don't know. And then, yeah. I think what's also interesting in that, yeah. how many properties is that, Ari? It's like hundreds? Uh, I don't know, 70, 80, maybe 100. Like one deal right now I bought for 22 million, and I'm, opening escrow for 72 million. So seven, you're opening okay. escrow for 72 million. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on. So the person that was selling it, what did they not see that you were able to do? Oh, I can disclose that to you. No, I'm just, oh. I was like, no, I have a confidentiality with it. It's a huge company buying it from me, but <clears throat> this property was basically, I'm repurposing it. So it's basically a land play. So I bought it because the, the uh, substantial land, uh, in a high density area and this developer is going to come and put, you know, four to 600 apartments on it. So to them, they're repurposing the dirt. So, so it's good money yeah. down. What's the value of your current portfolio today? 
I don't even know. No, I'm just kidding. No, a couple hundred million. Um, I've been waiting for a recession to buy because I made all my money in recessions. And that's why I have, you know, probably $30 million in cars. Um, last recession, I only have one Bugatti <laughs> because I was buying a lot of properties. So now I'm getting ready, gearing up to load up because next two years, I think it's going to present the mother of all buying opportunities when it comes to commercial. Not so much residential, maybe, but commercial real estate, a lot of defaults. So my, I you know I'm looking to double, triple that portfolio value. The two, two comments on that one, when you have, you've bought 70 or 80 and you have a portfolio of hundreds of millions now and you've spent billions. I also think it's like, how many places did you put offers in on that you didn't get? Cause I oh. that's like kind of a thing that people don't realize. Like how many have you swung that didn't, didn't work out a lot. <laughs> Well, on a, on a good day, I look at probably 20 properties, not physically, but, you know, on my lead flow. And I probably write an offer every three, four months on one. So if you look at, that's 150 deals a month I look at. Yeah. And in six months, that's 900 properties I look at with II, right? And then I make one offer. <laughs> and I haven't been able to get anything in escrow for the past 18 months. That tells you so a lot of swinging, but I'm not hitting the ball yet. Yeah. But I, I think that's the part I really wanted to highlight. Yeah. Because your strategy now, it's like, you're looking for opportunities and recessions and it, but it's not, you just it's not here yet. And you just go buy one and it magically works. It's like, I think people don't realize that. Yeah. They're not saying all that. Yeah. Yeah. You have to swing a lot of bats to hit in real estate and you gotta be patient because it's a game of patience and you gotta just wait for those cycles. And right now that you know, we are in a down cycle. So it's already started. Um, and with the Fed's increasing the rates 10 times, um, that's going to accelerate it. It already has. Um, and I think in the next 18 months, if people are, you know, geared up financially and mentally and powered up, knowing what they're going to be doing in which sub market, they can make a amazing, amazing return. What are the contrarian opportunities or contrarian things that people should be prepared for thinking about? Well, you know, when uh, contrarian mentality works with anything, like cars, you know, in um, when we had the lockdowns, some cars were selling for 50 cents on a dollar because people panic. Um, you know, they have the fear of, oh, it's end of the world. Uh, right now, it's the banking industry. You're seeing all the banks, you know, a lot of regional banks are collapsing. They're on their water. Uh, so a lot of people are taking their money out and putting it with bigger banks because they're scared they're going to lose their money. So fear um, and panic always creates opportunity. And, you know, whether it's real estate, cars, or stocks, in March 2020, stocks went down 30%. Uh, people that bought, they were contrarian, they made a killing, right? So um, you can use that. Of course, it's not it's easier than uh, said than done. But um, as you take risk uh, and, and be a contrarian and you, you know, make money and you have success with it, your um, I don't know, your balls get bigger. In in the real estate yep. portfolio, what's been like the biggest win you've had and the biggest loss? My biggest loss was a six story building I bought for 17 million and it was a single tenant. It was a subsidiary of Boeing, uh, USA, United Space Alliance. They used to handle all the communication with a space shuttle and they didn't get the contract from NASA. So they gave me a, I got a FedEx envelope with one page in there telling me they're going to vacate and my heart dropped. So 5 million cash down, gone. That was my biggest loss on a, in a real estate single deal, you know, and my biggest win 50 million. If I close this deal on one, on one, on one property. You got, how many companies yeah. do you have by the way? How many, what? how many companies do you have? Like I went to the oh. building, there was like 18 different stickers of all these businesses. Uh -huh. Yeah. I have a lot of different companies. Do you have an idea how many? Something. Uh, it, Six of them I can count right away on my fingers, but there's a lot others I invest on a silent partner. Like maybe, you know, I own a small percentage of a bank. I have several other companies. I, I'm a, just a LP, limited partner, but uh, the ones I'm actively managing, uh, there's six. Okay. And then yeah. for like owning a house like this, or do you have a lot, do you have passive income? Do you have like income from your own oh, real estate and that's what covers the lifestyle? Yeah, of course. Yeah, well, my business is make money. Plus, I have real estate, cash flow. Yeah, they're not empty buildings. I mean, I have shopping centers, this building. Like, I have a mortgage company upstairs, you know, pay me a lot of money. I got, you know, I mean, I have two or three buildings that I buy for flip that are vacant. Those are like reposition play. 
So, but when you have a big portfolio, obviously you have cash flow that, and some are value add that you're flipping. So it's a function of, it's a lot of fluid, you know, a lot of things happening. And um, I also make money with cars. How do you manage all these businesses? And how do you, and what is your, your team? I don't sleep much. I drink a lot of coffee. I get up four, four, between four and five in the morning. So I re respond to all the emails because I got properties in four different states, you know, and there sometimes those are two hours ahead. And I start getting emails early and then I uh, kind of go through my to-do list for the day and, and prioritize my day. By seven, I'm working out, uh, sauna, cold shower, get my third cup of coffee by eight, eight in the morning from a Starbucks. And I'm over here at the office, um, take lunch about 11.30. And then afternoon, I have a couple of meetings usually. And then I have to have a cigar by myself and regroup what happened all day yeah. that day and then get ready for the next day. What what things are you cheap on? Cheap on? Yeah. What things oh. do you not spend a lot of money on? Hmm. That's a good question. I'm trying to see what I'm... You should ask my wife. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, <clears throat> I don't like to spend, you know, like, I don't know, ten thousand dollars a bottle of wine because I honestly don't appreciate it. <laughs> to me, I can have a, a thirty dollar bottle of wine. I does the same thing. I get you know, I enjoy it just as much. Um, uh, I don't know. Maybe I guess maybe watches. I mean, I don't. It's a hundred thousand dollar watch, but I mean, I could buy a million dollar watch, but I don't. I think it's waste of money. <laughs> you know. Um, Maybe high fashion, you know. <laughs> this is not something that that matters as much to you, or no, I don't appreciate it as much. Maybe I don't know. I don't know, but I'm typically not cheap. Come on, no, no, it's not about that. You're, I, I, it's like yeah. for me, we, we, I'm, I'm going. I would say cheap. I would say that I would spend less money on it would be like expensive wines, champagne, or any anything else. I mean, I do drink cognac for five thousand dollar bottle of cognac because I smoke cigars. But wine, I'm not not so much. Take a, I charter jets all the time. Um, obviously, you know, jewelry, handbags, you know, on a special occasion, I like to treat my wife. And uh, just vacationing, I would say, probably is my biggest splurge. I love vacationing. We went to Lake Como, and I'm actually getting a villa for a couple of weeks, taking my entire family to Lake Como. So. How much does the private jet to charter cost? Yeah, it's about twelve thousand an hour. An hour. Mm -hmm. So if you're going, but so if you're going across America, a few hours. Yeah, like when we go to Cabo, it's like between forty to fifty thousand bucks just for the three days we go. And then how much is like the hotels and like this experience? Oh, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> it probably another fifteen twenty. Vacationing is the best money is spent because you know you can get time back, right? This one hour we spend, it's not gonna come back. It's gone. So you know, and you, as you get older, you appreciate time, and you, when you vacation, you're really spending your time with yourself and your loved ones. So it's the best money you spend. What's it like to drive around in a Rolls Royce? And like you know, as an immigrant, yeah. you come here, didn't speak English, didn't have money, lived in a, yeah. you lived in a Datsun, and now you're driving yeah. like a, this you know, hundreds of thousands of dollar car. Yeah. Well, I have four Rolls Royces. <laughs> I got two drop heads at dawn and a brand new ghost I bought for my wife. Um, you know, I hate to say it, but I, to me it's normal because I've been driving Rolls Royce since 2004. When Phantom came out, I bought a brand new Phantom. Back then, the lease payment on that car was more than my mortgage payment. But everybody said, you're crazy. I said, no, no, you got to get used to having a bigger overhead. And I went to the Rolls Royce in Newport Beach and I told them, give me the highest payment you can give. <laughs> they said, you mean lowest? I said, no, no, highest. So reduce the residual, whatever they do in leases, you know. I said, just, I want to pay down the, basically the lease. I want to have less payment in the year five when I want to buy it than, you know, normally you guys do. Do you have any regrets like working too hard? Was the money worth it? Or what regrets mm -hmm. do you have in you know, working too hard and was the money worth it? <laughs> Regrets, young, dumb, you know, I started making money uh, and I was partying, single, and drinking, driving. That's my biggest regret because my friend that was in my car, you know, the, my car spun out, lost uh, control. He wasn't wearing seatbelt, so he got ejected and 
you know, unfortunately he passed away. That was a very dark moment in my life, but I would say that's my biggest re regret in life. Wow. Being irresponsible, you know, young, doing stupid things, which I know a lot of young kids do, but you know, sometimes you can't bring undo things like that, right? And uh, yeah, you pay for that for the rest of your life. So that's like probably my biggest regret. Damn, man. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad to share that message. I do think like myself in the past have done it. I think a lot of people do it. So it's good to remember like it's not, they're not guaranteed to be safe there. Yeah. It was a very un unfortunate accident, but it's, uh, I take the blame because I was the one driving and, you know, I was under the influence. So it's, yeah, definitely um, something that, you know, most people will not really get it until it happens to them, you know, because you think, hey, everyone's, you know, back then everybody, all my friends, we used to go to clubs, bars, you have a few drinks and you get behind the wheel. Yeah. Like, it was like, accept that, you know, but that's one thing I regret the most. Do you feel like you work too much? Or that uh, you, you maybe don't? I don't work too much now. I used to work too much, you know, before, but now I have my kids, like right now, weekends, even if somebody pays me a million bucks, I wouldn't show up to do a seminar or work somewhere. Now, I do seminars for my students, but that's because it's part of the program, but I'm saying as a speaker or a job or a gig, you know, I wouldn't work on weekends because I'd rather spend that with my kids. How do you define success for yourself? Because I think when a lot of people see you, they say success, but I've always thought success is actually an internal measurement. So I'm mm -hmm. curious how you think about it or how you would decide it. Well, to me, success is having the freedom to choose what you want to do when you wake up and being able to give back, um, which I think I've achieved. So, you know, I, it's not how much money you have in the bank or how much is your net worth, it's being able to have the freedom. If you loved this video, you are going to love this video right up here with John Paul DeJuria, the billionaire founder of Patron Tequila and Paul Mitchell Care Hair Systems. Make sure to subscribe to the channel if you're not already. Uncle Noah loves you, and I'll see you out there. Pew, pew.